Greetings to those of you who are tuning in on the YouTube channel. Great to have you listen or watch. Thanks for joining us in that way. And I'm so grateful to be here on this lovely summer morning in 2024. Uh, the Karen Chapel Service messages cycle through a large number of themes. And today's theme is change or transformation. And a uh, focus for me in thinking about it this week is um, the tension between incremental and more substantial or uh, integral comprehensive change. So that's kind of where I'm heading. But I'm going to be here. Some of you know I do all too often. And um, the word substantial, as I was preparing, sent me down this bunny trail. Because I remember learning in seminary about the evolution of theology in the Christian churches. And it turns out in the first few centuries of the development of the Christian faith, there were debates about the nature of the central human and not human aspects of the Jesus life. And some people wanted to argue that Jesus was extraordinary, but not necessarily fully of the same substance as God. And so how holy or entirely divine Jesus might have been became this massive issue. And in the fourth century, there were councils that were convened in 325 in Nicaea, and then in 381 in Constantinople. And later today, um, one of our uh, guests is going to be reading what has become in the Roman Catholic Church a reading every Sunday, which is called the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed. And uh, a lot of you won't gonna be like, what? But um, you'll hear it later. In any case, this document, which is the Catholic tradition's merger of two faith statements that happened in the fourth century, sought to settle the issue. And, make a claim that entirely ruled out these speculations that Jesus was mm, somehow less than fully God. And uh, why I sort of bring that to the table here is that I think that people who are entering addiction, recovery, and family members, the preoccupation tends to be very narrow. It's like, I just wish this person would stop snorting cocaine or drinking or shooting heroin or, you know, whatever. It's very very focused behavioral change. And there's a curiosity and a bewilderment that comes when people come to a treatment environment or they dip their toe in the recovery communities and they hear, especially in the 12-step world, this is a spiritual program. And um, people are like, what? And Behind that claim that the invitation of 12-step recovery is more comprehensive of a change than just the mere behavior change is, for me, an idea like that there's something akin for me in the, in the idea of adopting a faith perspective because like a lot of us can sort of believe, but then can I like entirely believe? And, um, and I'm sort of willing to explore not drinking or uh, whatever, but I don't know that I need to address comprehensively my approach to life. So theology and recovery come together for me in this dialectic, the, the two sort of possibilities. I can change a little bit or I can change a lot. And in, uh, if you, if, if there are people in the room who probably do know the 12 steps very intimately, and a lot of us don't, a lot of you don't, uh, they happen to have been really important for me. I'm a person in long-term recovery. And one of the things that was pointed out to me on my journey was the specific wording in the 12th of AA's 12 steps, which says, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. So there's a claim there, even in the 12th of the AA 12 steps, that spiritual awakening is what happens as people pursue the path. And spiritual awakening sounds, it doesn't say having had a, a successful, uh, you know, departure from drinking. It doesn't, it doesn't say that. It says this spiritual awakening claim. And 
There, there are things in the middle passage of steps that also bewilder people. In fact, there's this thing called a fearless and searching moral inventory. And I remember when I first heard that, I was like, first of all, moral? Like, why is a fearless and searching moral inventory being asked of me when I just want to figure out how to stop the substances? So um, if you look at other recovery options for people today in terms of mutual support, which is a theme that I've been addressing this week as patients and a couple of speaking opportunities that I had, um, recovery dharma is a Buddhist variation on how to be in a communal setting and help one another to achieve and sustain recovery. And I think it's fair to say that recovery dharma also proposes a kind of thoroughgoing change in the person. Because Buddhism's central hope for people is referred to as enlightenment. And, um, and enlightenment is, a, is an awakening experience. So interestingly there, the Buddhist and the 12-step forms of recovery come right alongside each other. And you, it's not like you can say, oh, I'm going to do the Buddhist thing because it doesn't ask me to make a comprehensive change. No. Both the Buddhist and the 12-step things, I think, do ask for comprehensive change. And I would argue even the third that we talk about a lot here at Karen is smart recovery. And I would say if you're going to do smart recovery, it doesn't sort of get you off the hook of dramatically shifting in your attitude and outlook on life. So what if you're not willing to consider a kind of wholesale transformation? The, best practices for clinical training, which Karen is really interested in being informed by, caution the clinician to meet the patient where they are. And so I've, I've been trained a great deal to be cautious about pushing more change on a person than they are willing to entertain. Because unfortunately, people, especially people who have this addictive presentation, like, you know, the family says, you need to stop drinking. And the, and the drinking person says, oh, yeah? And, like, goes and drinks more. And there's a rebellious sort of adversarial dynamic that comes up when society pushes. There's a pushback. And so one of the things I mentioned in one of the lectures I did this week was a thing called moderation management. And moderation management emerged on the landscape of support programs in, in a couple decades ago. And it came on the scene by a person who sort of took inspiration from the AA and other recovery movements, but wanted to help people who wanted to reduce their consumption of substances, wanted to drink moderately. Sounds pretty awesome to a lot of people. Um, so, uh, this wasn't in my outline, but I will say, I, when I'm, I'm in my second marriage, and when I started dating my wife, now my wife, and I was watching her consumption of alcohol, it was very intermittent and didn't seem to follow any good pattern. And I remember finally thinking, God damn it, if I could drink like her, I would drink every day. <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of rules out moderation management for me. <laughs> Thank you for laughing so much. It, it, it's a bad crowd that gets that joke. So. <laughs> Or my crowd, you're my people. <laughs> so, so, you know, the story of moderation management is tragic. The woman who founded it, and it got a lot of press, you know, New York Times and all this stuff. Hey, maybe this is an innovative thing on the landscape of, you know, addiction related causes. And I think people were really curious if it helped people. And it may vary, it still exists. But the woman who founded it had a terrible sort of unfolding of her journey. Had multiple DUIs, started going to AA instead of moderation management, was viewed as sort of having betrayed the, you know, the emergent movement, and eventually took her life. Really cautionary tale. At the same time, I will say, I am persuaded that uh, you know, the you have to stop entirely is not an effective clinical strategy. I, I totally believe that if we grab you by the collar and shake you and say, this is not going to work anymore, you better stop, that's a terrible form of collaboration with a client and will not 
do very well, except with the client who is ready and wants that. So there's this thing called harm reduction. I don't know if any of you have heard of it, but it's a, it's a best practices thing. And harm reduction, from a theological perspective, I love this line, it, it begins with the notion that God loves people who use drugs. I, I really like that line, by the way. I'm quite convinced of it. I'm quite convinced that we should not like shame the crap out of people who find themselves in these tailspins, partly because, as I'm gonna mention later on in the message, I think there's an addictive aspect to being a human being. I think we get hooked, and most of you are hooked on your phones, right? You can't deny it. Um, and if I told you you were gonna go for five days without it, you'd be like, <gasps> and so harm reduction seeks to meet people in, ex in that journey of experimentation. I wonder if I can dial this back. I wonder if, like, and so these are safe injection sites and for the IV drug user. These are, uh, you know, um, gentle approaches where people are seeking to experiment with stopping but find themselves continuing to return to use and uh, where that, like, kind of punitive and shame-oriented dynamic is decreased. And I think the, the field of addiction care is only beginning to learn how to do harm reduction well. And my prediction is that as the years continue now, this will become something that, especially not so much addiction residential care, because I think by the time people get here, the insurance companies have decided, hmm, a harm reduction strategy is not really where you are. So the insurance companies paying for many of you to be in this room have reach the conclusion that the outcomes that they want to see for you, which will decrease their cost of outlay in the end, is to help support you in finding an abstinence-oriented path. So, um, I, I, I will come back to the original part of the message, which is to say, This is, this is definitely a hard thing. It really is, and for some people, some people are bizarrely like granted an early gift out of the trap. So um, I happened to meet one of our clients in an AA meeting yesterday out in the community, and I was so excited to see her there, which is just fantastic. And um, But if, if you come out of treatment and you go to the 12-step rooms or you go to Recovery Army, you'll meet these people that will annoy you because they'll be like, I went to my first meeting and I never used again. And you're like, <laughs> I went to 12 treatments before I got a year, you know? Like, because uh, there's probably a person in the room here who's like feeling that way about themselves. And it takes what it takes, I said to somebody who I just met at the beginning of the chapel service, who I, and I could feel as they were introducing themselves to me that the person who was in treatment with us has been in treatment before. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's harder for some to find freedom from the active addiction as it degrades the quality of their lives than others. It's as if the demon wrapped around the legs or the chain is harder to unshackle. But I'm not going to give up on my original start here of this message, which is that I think what really provides full, authentic, sustainable recovery is a deeper, authentic transformation of the individual person inside. And that when I, if I say, I'm, I'm, if I focus on the behavior and seek to just pull the behavior away, the behavior is helping me cope. I'm doing this because it helps me sort of deal with something. So, um, in fact, one of the people in the meeting that I was in yesterday was about 45 days into their sobriety and was crying because they were feeling so many emotions they couldn't handle it. And this is because that person has lost their coping mechanism, which was holding all of that emotionality at bay. And the path forward that gives freedom from that is not only healthy sort of movement through whatever that stuff has been unprocessed, but then the adoption of a way of life that doesn't result in <clears throat> the sort of backlog of a unprocessed grief, trauma, sadness, anger, depression, you know, all that. It's a, it's a new way of being. And uh, you know, I would love to tell you that I've got that all worked out and that my life since I 
began my alcohol abstinence in 1989 has been marked by such an extraordinary transformation that I have not, you know, sort of wrestled with my individual demons. I, I can't say that. What I, what I can say is that people who have seen me along the way, two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 34 years, and have said in reflection back to me that they see a person who's very different than the person they knew before. Even like from 10 years of sobriety to 20 years of sobriety, I'm a, I became very, very different. Not because I had, it's not because I returned to drinking and then stopped again, it's because the manifestation of my dis regulated attachment crap has played whack-a-mole and I, my addict nature has come out in various different areas. And today in terms of best practices in clinical care, one of the things that we're trying to help train our clinicians here is about what we call addiction and interaction disorder, which is some of you know most of them, like gambling, uh, shopping, food-related disorders, sex-related disorders, pornography. Um, and I, I, I think it's, here again, medicine is lagging behind because the medical diagnostic framework for addictive disorders does not include a few of those that I just mentioned. It's very much ready to embrace eat, eating food-related disorders as an addictive phenomenon and gambling as an addictive phenomenon. But why it hasn't gotten on the wavelength with internet gaming or sex or uh, like, which those of us who work in this area are like, clearly there are people who are addicted in those lanes. Um, yesterday in the news, there was a piece uh, about um, consumer debt. And um, in the American consumer debt, credit card debt is over a trillion dollars. And 50% of people who have credit cards don't pay them off at the end, of, like don't, don't have, have lagging balances. So you, know, you might not think that's an addictive thing, but there's a whole program called Debtors Anonymous that specifically seeks to address and support people who find themselves compulsively spending money they don't have. And um, Amazon Prime Day, anybody like have that itch about it? I definitely do. So I'm glad it's gone. I was really like, I, I passed that test, you know, that gauntlet. And, uh, So, my invitation is twofold. It is to invite you to embrace the idea that whatever brought you here, especially to this level of care, anticipates a thoroughgoing, fundamental transformation. By the time you hit these red chairs, it's not just about a tweak in a little bit of your landscape. And for family members, like, if you're thinking, oh, let, let's just get the 28-day cliff and then have them just come back and just have them not, like, not drink anymore or whatever, that's a really bad framing of hope which, for which outcomes will be sadly lacking. There, there was a whole narrative when I first was getting to people like, hey, it doesn't work. And you know, they used to say, like, look at the person to your left, look at the person to your right, and only one of you will be sober at this period of time from now. Very depressing kind of thing. That turns out not to be helpful and not to be accurate. It turns out that people can and do recover from this illness in amazing like numbers. And Karen's outcomes are really, really good, and other treatment do really quite well, which is why insurance still continues to pay for this, because they wouldn't pay for it if they didn't see it as an effective method of treatment. And the way they measure it is additional outlay of cash. So what they're finding out is that if they pay for treatment at this level, you, especially at Karen, you won't need more treatment. Which is really, really promising. It doesn't mean you're guaranteed you never take a sip of alcohol ever again in your life or whatever, like never have some sort of acting out sort of thing. But it does mean that the crisis that brings you to this level of care, when brought to this level of care, is not necessarily likely to repeat itself in, in, in large percentages of people who get this level of care. So, I love that we have the song that we just had because I want to ask you, do you believe in it? Do you believe in the full capacity for your lives and the lives of your loved ones to change? I, I think that that's the magic of the Karen Chapel service is that it, this place every Sunday is a festival of hope. It is a, it is a place that bears witness to the transformational 
reality of addiction recovery. People can and do get better. You can and will. You, 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 I believe I can fly, right? That, that capacity to soar, that capacity to find new freedom and new happiness is entirely in reach. And if you struggle to find it, don't give up. The Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed is going to be read shortly. And it talks about, I believe in God the Father. I believe in Jesus Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the, you know, like these things. And these are claims of faith that pull people towards a thing that they struggle with. And I'm going to tell you that I believe in recovery. I believe in your capacity to find a new way of living. And I believe that the values that you hold dear will manifest in a better way when you take this path. You will become the people that you yearn to be. And... Uh, and the shame that has dogged your life and made and it dogs families too. People are like, oh, I can't believe we're having to deal with these problems. And I can't believe our son or daughter or mom or dad, or husband or wife are so broken. But the and this is where I wanted to like make sure I did say, I think I probably said it six times already, but it is that gently it's unwise to think of what you want out of this experience as a small thing. Shoot for the moon. Think of this as an opportunity to, to really heal, to really become different, to, re to, to, to get to the point where someday you or you'll come to visit your family member walking down the south to get a medallion, and people will be clapping and going, yay, not because, yes, you stopped drinking for them six months or a year or two years or five years, but because of who you've become. Almost invariably when people stand here at the microphone and get these medallions, they're talking about, I went to school, I'm, I'm working in, in helping people, I, you know, I, I, they, they bring spouses and kids, they, they're, they're, we see that their whole world is transformed. This is not about stopping alone. This is not about stopping alone. This is about regaining the capacity to thrive, to flourish, to have that which is what you want at the deepest core of your being. Let's, let's believe together. Thank you so much.